So let me ask you a question, and, I, and I'm serious now. How many of you, if you could, would like to have a career or at least be making money as a public speaker? Seriously. Okay, great. I think Loana would too, but she... Yes, she would. So I'm speaking to the right audience. That's great. When I was divorced in 1995, I walked away from that marriage with two resolutions. The first was that I would join Toastmasters, and the second, I wanted to speak professionally. Don't know why, that was the first thing that came into my mind when I realized I was going to be on my own. While I was working at Montgomery Wards, I got a job there, met Mike Churchill, said, hey, why don't you come to a Toastmaster club? Well, I was started. And then over the next seven, eight, nine years, I began to develop my speaking abilities, and I was trying to find ways to get past whatever had been stopping me in my life. So as I kept working on things, I developed workshops, and when I would, or I, you know, I developed the information. I take the information, develop it into a Medical workshop, record, six, and zero, present one, five, it. One. Medical record 60151, please. And over that time, I finally got to a point where I realized I truly could become a professional speaker. I said, that, that just so excited me. Now then the question was, how do you become a professional speaker? At that time, I was like a lot of people, I thought you just go out and you speak every time you can, anywhere, everywhere, and over a period of time, somehow, you'll develop a career into a professional speaker. And what I found was the more you went out and gave free speeches, the more free speeches people would like you to give. <laughs> it was endless. I could spend the rest of my life doing free speeches. But nobody ever volunteered to pay. So I quit doing free speeches. But I was still pr pr plagued with the question, how do you do it? Now I did have an opportunity uh, to do two presentations and through those I got a plan that I am confident will work. So I developed it in my head and I had, and that was some years ago. So I've been waiting till I'm ready to go out being a professional speaker. Well, I finally got to the point where I'm ready, but I still kept waiting. <laughs> and then a few weeks ago, there was a crisis in character that occurred in my life. And I said, okay, it's time to get off the bench and get in the game. Well, then my marketing program was like, okay, we need to put it into practice. But then I thought, you know, I've got this idea. I should share it with the people who really could benefit from, from it as much as I could. Because that's where all my workshops come from. Things that I developed for me and then want to share it with others. So here's the question. If you don't have a book to your name, and you don't have credentials behind your name, and you don't have a name that anybody knows, and you don't know anybody who has a name that somebody knows, and you're not doing what you're going to speak about, how do you develop a career as a professional speaker? The answer, give free speeches. <laughs> ah, but wait, you got to do it with a plan a purpose and a reason and that's what I'm going to share with you before we do I want to talk about your product I used to be a salesman for years and the thing if you're going to be a good salesman is you've got to have a product you're passionate about you know passion is extremely important right it's like the judge said on the cooking show on the Food Network and it was one of the chefs brought a dish that he was you know competing with and he made some statement about, you know, he was trying this, you know, he wasn't really passionate about it, but he would, and the judge said, what do you mean? If you're not passionate about it, why should I be? You know, and that's true. If what you're sharing, your product, isn't something that's meaningful to you, why would it be meaningful to anybody else? So, when you have a message, let me suggest, if you're going to go out and do it professionally, that you have five, at least five or six different messages pr that you could give to the same audience and it would always be new. Okay? So we think of having, you know, one message we're going to take out to a lot of audiences. You're going to run out. You see, Zig Ziglar basically had one message. Tony Robbins basically had one message. You see, uh, Kunst, what's his name? It was in your 
Koontz, the Toastmaster, Arnold, oh, Arnold Koontz, came in here and gave us a presentation some months ago about Abraham Lincoln. He can take that message and change it into five different speeches. He could do one on courage, one on leadership, one on handling failure, <clears throat> basically with the same material. So it's important to have a product that you can take and develop to the same group but have a different way of saying it that you keep people's interest. Now I'm going to talk about delivery. So if you're going to be a professional speaker, you need a message, a product, and then you need to be able to tell it well. That means being able to keep their interest, keep them involved, and then a lot of times it's getting them to a buying decision where they're going to take on what you said, they're going to change their life. Because ultimately, see it doesn't matter how well we do it, if our message doesn't touch people, then really why do they want to listen? So there's three mantras that I have developed as a professional speaker. The first one was from the late, great Steve Allen. And I loved him as a kid. And he says, people pay more to be entertained than they will to be educated. So when I heard that, and I was just a new Toastmaster, I thought that I've got to learn to be entertaining. Now that wasn't my nature. See, when I gave a speech or a talk to people, their response was, Cliff, you'd make a great Baptist preacher. <laughs> Doom's fire, hail and damnation. <laughs> Unfortunately, it scared them. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I really got to take this entertaining on seriously. So the first thing I do if I want to learn something is I develop a program to teach it because that's how I want to learn it. So I developed a program, How to Develop and Deliver a Humorous Presentation, which led to a workshop which I am capable of selling and I have developed six or seven humor speeches in Toastmasters which three of them have gone to division. One almost went to district I think but I went over it by a few seconds. I feel very confident, confident de developing and delivering a humor speech. Now that doesn't make me funny because I'm not funny but I've learned to incorporate humor into my presentations. The other thing was stories. You've got to be able to tell stories. Well, I wanted to learn to tell stories, so guess what I did? I paid for writing workshops, and I worked on writing stories, because I do want to be a writer. I do want a book after my name at some point. So I really worked at mastering the stories and the entertainment, but one thing about I, I failed to realize until last week or a couple weeks ago when the lieutenant gave a speech, entertaining isn't just humor, it's also drama. And listening to his speech, I realized that a very dramatic story or something that doesn't weigh the, the audience down but leaves them at the end inspired is just as effective and even more so than humor if it's done well. The second mantra is know your audience. So I gave a speech. I was invited to do a presentation at a, a women's shelter. Okay. And so I, they said, we want you to do something that's going to encourage them and empower them. So I did a presentation. They loved it. They called me back. I did a second one. Now, I changed the second one. I changed it because I thought, you know, I really didn't get my message across. I, some things I'm missing. So I altered it, gave the second one. They didn't send back a letter. They like we with saying, we would like you to do it again, but can you cut it down 30 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, that won't work. <laughs> well, now I had an opportunity to do for one at women's shelter a few months later, and so I'm really going to work on this, develop it. So I really put some time into that presentation. And when I got done, they really liked it. I could see this really touched them. I never heard back from them. <laughs> they never asked me to come back. Something's missing. So here's my second mantra. People will pay for what they want more than what they need. I was giving the women what I thought they needed instead of what they wanted. You see, what I did the first time was I gave them a presentation, presentation that was 30 minutes talk and 30 minutes an exercise. And at the end of the exercise, they were jazzed. They were excited. The problem is, I didn't feel comfortable that I had given them the information that would really make that exercise go beyond into the future. Know your audience. What do they need? So my first question to you was, 
How many of you want to be a professional speaker? Well, I know I'm speaking to the choir then, because this is what we're all after. <coughs> so my third mantra is, if you don't write it down, you don't want it. I have never written goals down, because I never really wanted them. When I decided, I'm going to, I make, here's my goal, I make $5,000 a month from public speaking by December 31st. When I was willing to write that down, it became a reality. If you won't write down your goals in public speaking, you don't want them! And don't pretend you do! For whatever reason, maybe you are afraid, you know, maybe you think you're not ready. But if you're not, if I, if I'm not willing to write it down, I don't want it. And when I accepted that, my life changed. So now we want our marketing plan. Are you ready? Ready. Mm -hmm. First, when you start your marketing plan, you base it upon level of expectation. This is as a new speaker. You want to choose a venue, an audience, where the level of expectation is low. <laughs> so the level of forgiveness is high. See, that's the nice thing about a Toastmaster Club. When you make a mistake in a Toastmaster Club, you rarely ever think about it the next day. Because the level of expectation is low and the level of forgiveness is high. So start off like that. So the first audience that I am going to go after is vocational uh, schools, low techs. The reason being that a level of expectation, and you always just follow the money. Wherever the money comes from determines the level of expectations. So with vocational schools, where's the source of money? The students. And the students' expectations are low and their forgiveness is high, and you're only speaking to one class to 30 or so people, if you make a mistake, no one's going to remember it. So it's a very effective place to start. But there's other places. For example, you can have churches, schools, public, private. Where are other places you can start that would have a low level of expectation that, you could, that are free, of course? You know, where else could you go? Work. Okay, what kind of work? Uh, the, your work environment, you know, your co-workers. Okay. Would they have a low level of exp Well, they probably would, yeah. but what kind? Okay, so that's fine. So your fellow workers. What? No, mine would expect more. Prisoners? That's true. <laughs> you know what? It would depend upon your work. So if you work at Intel or a professional company, they're going to have... Yeah, I wouldn't go to my work until I was at the second level. Uh, networking okay. meetings. Okay, networking meetings. Excellent. Where else? My shelter. <laughs> okay, yes. So... We're raising Women's the bar, though. What now? We're raising the bar, though. Well, that's great. No, but that is an example. Okay, so that's uh, women's shelters, uh, social organizations, you know, where people get together and they're just glad to have somebody <coughs> Lions come. Lions Club, all those lunch meetings. They, they all have. those things. Now, I would exclude rotaries. Rotaries would be the next group up, which I'll explain why. So you have a whole list of, of groups, of venues, of audiences that have a low level of expectation, a high level of forgiveness. It's a great place to start. But here's an important point. Choose your audience. This is where you begin to plan your free speeches so they become paid speeches. You choose an audience that's going to enhance your image. My son, who uh, got a job with CBS out in uh, New York, wants to go to uh, business business school for uh, his master's. So he was looking at Columbia because they have a good name and that's important for you on your resume or have you. But his boss suggested he go to Wharton. What is it? Wharton? How do you pronounce it? Wharton. 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 Okay. I never heard of them. But they're like the more exclusive. I mean, they're exclusive of the exclusive. He says, I can't get in. I said, really? There's a lot of people. He said, about a thousand people from around the world and they only take a hundred. And who do they take? the CFOs, the CEOs, they take the top level of the top level of management. And he said, the reason is, they want the graduates to enhance their image. Right. I never thought about that. But Harvard and all these other, you know, they want the cream of the crop so they look good. Not the student. They expect the student to look good. They want, the school wants to. You can do and should do the exact same thing. 
See, that's why going around in all these places and giving free speeches doesn't work. Choose where you're going to give your speeches. So if I'm looking at vocational schools, I want to find the ones that have the top reputation for the students that graduate from their class. That's who I'm going to go to. Now, in doing that, again, they're glad to have you show up, right? Because let's face it, anybody that's willing to come in and talk to their students about things that are important to their students, they're going to want to have them look good. So your marketing plan. You begin to do the things we're going to be talking about in the next meeting, your one step and all of those things, uh, your one sheet, your bio. And all. But for this group, all you need is a one page. You have a brief introduction. My name is Cliff Brack. I'm a general contractor. I also do professional speaking. And then you have what your speech is about. I've developed a program entitled, Are You Valuable or Just in, is Important? Are You Valuable or Just Important? And it deals with how in the workplace, valuable employees are worth more money than those who are just important. I would like to uh, present the speech to see how it works, how it affects your students. Would you be interested? And have a little photograph of me in the corner. How many think that I would get a positive response? Just one? Mm -hmm. I think I will. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of it. Now, I'm in there, I'm talking to them, I'm developing a rapport, and guess what? I'm also perfecting my material. I am becoming, because you should do it at least once every week, okay, at twice as better, and you do that for two months, three months, and, you are, and now you expand to another vocational school. You're also now working with the teachers, with the administration, because they're looking at you as, this man is a professional, and I am a professional, and they're grateful that I'm taking my skills and talents to enhance the education of their club because of their school. If I do it right, I make the student's education more valuable. And what does that do for the school? It makes me valuable. Because see, one thing I do practice, I practice being valuable to my customers, not important. Now, I'm ready to move on to the second step. And what's the second step? A higher level of expectation, a lower level of forgiveness. And for me, I'm going to go after the nonprofits. Now, why are the nonprofits a higher level of education? Where do they get their money? A lot of them get it from corporate sponsors. And that's who I'm going to go after. Those who depend upon corporate sponsors, because what am I wanting to do? I'm wanting to build the same kind of relationship with the management and the nonprofit so that when I'm ready to go to the next step, I say to them, what? What am I going to do? Too much? No, not yet. No. <laughs> Who's their sponsors? Corporations. So what do I want management and the nonprofit to do? Introduce you. Introduce me. Refer me. You see, as a salesman, I learned a long time ago. I hate cold calling, but I do it because you have to. But it's easier to go cold calling if I work what I have so that they will refer me to what I want. Then it's done. I only have to maintain what the level of expectation is to the corporate people. So now I begin, and while, okay, so while you're doing this, uh, you're working with your, non, your non-profits, You're going to be developing your marketing material. You're going to finish your one sheet. You're going to get your bio. Because while you're doing this for months, guess what's happening is you're going out to that low level expectation. You're beginning to feel like a professional speaker. Makes that, <coughs> that uh, one sheet much easier. Makes that bio much easier. And the, the main thing you're also looking for is you're working up the ladder. Is you're looking for letters of recognition or letters of reference. If you don't know the person really well and you want them to give you a letter and you don't feel comfortable to say, can you recommend me, you say, will you give me a letter of recognition, Me meaning what? They know you. That, that you gave the speech, yes. They know you, he gave the speech, blah, blah, blah. Now, they're always going to say something nice, but it gets you to find out how excited they are about you and your presentation. It's a way of getting evaluations. Asking, ask yourself, am I comfortable asking for a recommendation? If I'm not, ask for a recognition, find out what's missing. Now, 
as you're doing this too, building it up, you're looking for testimonials, you're looking for letters, you're looking for credibility. You realize that's all a brochure, that's all your marketing it is, it's providing credibility. So you're constantly looking for it. Now at my presentation on the open house, uh, my speech is entitled, Who Made You an Expert? And it's all about creating credibility. So if that's important to you, I invite you to be there at our open house. And if you have friends or somebody that really could benefit from it, it'd be worth their time to attend. So you're developing your, your, your marketing material, you're developing your references, and now you've got your leads into your corporate offices. And from there, well, it shouldn't take a year. That's for, that's for Toastmaster.